the thing that um, the thing that appealed to me about them as a group because their art is always seen as kind of very soft it's like these pink cheeked little girls and, and these fields of flowers and these water lilies and so forth and people who are into modern art you know they think oh it's not edgy enough it's not you know but in fact in context it is because painting had to be done according to what the salon said which was in a certain way from light from dark to light and bringing up and, and you could paint a nude but it had to be um, Psyche or Venus um, it couldn't actually be just uh, some chick from Paris and the Impressionists they didn't do that and they could have easily made a living they all have the skill to make a living as a salon painter but they decided as a group individually and as a group in, a, in around the mid 1860s that they would not do what the salon said and they would paint what they saw their impressions of modern life in France and by doing that they basically gave up survival or or what was in the interest of survival for an ideal and and the way I identify with that and I although I, I don't put myself in their class but when I started writing I, I fancied myself a horror story writer and about that time uh, that I was thinking about I wanted to try and go pro um, there was an anthology that came out called Dark Forces of Original Horror Stories and it was edited by a guy named Kirby McCauley who was an agent for Stephen King <coughs> and Peter Straub and Dean Kuhn so I mean sort of like the guys who were in charge of horror and he said the reason that horror works and has worked for 200 years is that it is something that can be combined with any other element and still work except whimsy there's no such thing as a successful, whimsical horror story. <laughs> and I thought, what does he know? <laughs> and I wrote a book called Practical Demon Keeping, which is, thank you, which is a whimsical horror story. And here I stand, 22 years later, um, you know, whatever we are, number three on the, uh, on the New York Times bestseller list with another whimsical horror story. And only number three because um, you're not allowed to kill James Patterson. <laughs> um, he's like the Terminator. <laughs> it's like you crush him and he just comes from his own puddle into a, another, you know, two pe writes two books a week. And I'm trying a new myth because for years I tried to convince everybody that he had Vietnamese children chained in his basement writing his book. <laughs> And that just wouldn't, you know, they, and that didn't stop anybody from buying his books. So, you know, so he's number two with, you know, I don't know what the hell he's number two with, but it's some, you know, his book this week. And um, so now I'm trying to make people convince, convince him that he is a Terminator and self-replicating. He's like the Borg, maybe, in, uh, in Star Trek. Yeah, or, you know, but if you have a better idea when I'm signing your book saying, no, you know what you should do? Because I tried today to say that every time you bought a James Patterson book, um, the devil sodomizes Emily Dickinson. <laughs> I know, I know. You think that would deter people? But I can't, I don't even want to admit how many people thought, and the downside is? <laughs> They did, they were like, that would be cool, you know, and, uh, and, and the classic, didn't happen if there isn't video, uh, so, I, you, you people are disgusting. Uh, 